Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Lip Balm 101, believe it or not. It's the 101st first Lip Balm today. And today we featured Tara Betts, Seda Agostini Bostich, and Terry Ellen Cross Davis. Uh, and just for those of you who'd like to know, coming up we have uh, Anjali Motodiva, Susan Bloomberg, Cass, and Whitney Scherer, and Yelena Lambersky on September 10. On September, se September 17 is a flash fiction show um, with Meg Pograss, Jeff Friedman, Michael C. Keith, Robert Scolia, Arno, and Kim Ching Kee. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the show. Um, in the meantime, I'm happy to introduce um, my, my favorite uh, co-host, because we've had several co-hosts on the series. Uh, Larissa Schneilow, Jonathan Penton, and I originally started the series. Um, and Cassandra joined us later. Um, unfortunately, what I have done is not open that file yet. So that's what I'm going to do now. Um, oh, it's quick, quick. So Cassandra is an award-winning writer, scholar of prose poetry and professor of writing and literature in Melbourne, Australia. Her most recent books of prose poetry are Pre-Raphaelite, Leftovers, and Fugitive Letters. And by the way, Cassandra only writes prose poetry. She's currently writing a book of prose poetry on the atomic bomb with funding from the Australia Council. Cassandra co-wrote Prose Poetry, an introduction, which is an amazing book and covers the history and the current status of things in prose poetry uh, worldwide, which came out with Princeton U Press. Um, and also the anthology of Australian prose poetry. She is commissioning editor for Wesley Magazine. What you got for us today? Yeah, I live and breathe prose poetry. I'm a devotee, a tragic one. Um, so today I've been asked to write 21 prose poems on salt and salty. Um, so here's, here's one called Cured. In the museum shop at the Thiessen, you buy me a Balenciaga filigree choker. It's bright blue velvet ribbon threaded through the latticed design. It reminds me of roses growing up a trellis or the unfurling of a music box scroll with its raised notes like braille. When you take me to dinner, I wear my yellow dress. The accordion pleats remind you of an origami sun's rays. On the menu, we revel in the description of Mohama. Loins of tuna cured in salt, washed, laid out to dry in the sun and breeze for 15 to 20 days. When it arrives, bright almonds and olive oil stud the plate with light. My thighs quiver when you smooth out a long pleat on my skirt. The fanning of salt cured tuna around my plate is like tongues on my neck. I would like to introduce Marc Vincennes, who writes more than prose poetry, he writes everything. He is an anglo swiss American poet, a fiction writer, translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist, and musician. He has published 20 books of poetry, including more recently, Einstein Fledermouse, The Little Book of Earthly Delights, A Brief Conversation with Consciousness, There Might Be a Moon or a Dog with Gazebo in Australia, uh, 39 Wonders and Other Management Issues, which is forthcoming from Spite and Dival, The Pearl Diver of Irunmani, forthcoming from White Pine Press, he also has, if that isn't enough, an album of music, ambience and verse, left hand clapping forthcoming from Tree Torn Records. Vincent is a prolific translator and he's translated from, our regulars know this, German, Romanian and French. He's published 11 books of translations, most recently an Audible Blue Selected Poems 1963 to 2016 by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Mertz, just out from White Pine Press. He is currently working on a novel, a beautiful, brilliant, exciting novel called The Age of Occasions. Vincennes is editor and publisher of Mad Hat Press. He's publisher of New American Writing. He's lived all over the world, from Brazil to China to Iceland to India. He was born in Matilda Hospital on the peak in Hong Kong, but he now lives on a farm, as you all know, in rural western Massachusetts, overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain and where there are Okay, wait for this one. Changes every week. There are more brown marmorated stink bugs, spiny assassin nymphs, and broad-necked root borers than people. That was a great one. I love your insects this week, Mark. Thank you. I love me some insects. Uh, in fact, when I took a walk with uh, 
my dog, Emily Dickinson, today, um, we walked through this meadow of, of wildflowers and they were up to, up to my eyes um, and the bees were everywhere. The bees were everywhere. It was unbelievable and wonderful to see that the diversity of life is still going strong despite all our you know, troubles for the moment. Anyway, with that in mind, um, I'm going to read a poem from my book, There Might Be a Moon or a Dog, which came out from the gazebo in Australia. And this poem is called A Tedious Paradigm for Angela Vincennes Seach, my mother. In the quietest corner of the room, with our shoulders bowed under the weight of the whole house, we listen to the wind in the sheets drying outside on the line. How many summers since the buzz of insects, the birds in the trees, and my mad mother naked but for a shower cap, strolling the halls of her confinement before death. We will seek refuge yet again among these forms, among the noxious moths and the egg-carrying wasps, all those withering risks. You know the demon will rise from the ice, my mother had said, all the chimney tops smoking their temperance as someone rises up and shakes, circles the coffee table and the art books. I believe there's one from Chagall there, dog-eared, at a painting of thunderbolts and chains. The thirst consumes you in the last hours as if you'd rather be one with the sea than the earth. Better to be salt than dirt, mother once said, hunched over a crusette, stirring in some hand-picked thyme. And she knew how to hand-pick thyme, her mother, that's for sure. And now I am absolutely delighted to introduce um, Tara Betts, who is the author of Break the Habit and Arc and Hue. In addition to her work as a teaching artist and mentor for young poets, she has taught several universities, including Rutgers, Northwestern, and University of Illinois, Chicago, and at Stateful Prison via the Prison and Neighborhood Arts Project. She is the inaugural poet for the People Practitioner Fellow at University of Chicago. Tara serves as poetry editor at the Langston Hughes Review and is founder for the nonprofit organization, the Whirlwind Learning Center on Chicago's South Side. Welcome, Tara. Thank you, Mark. I'm really happy to be here. I have yet to come to Australia in person. So if this is what I can do for now, <laughs> I'm very happy to at least meet some of you and share some poems today. Um, it's my, as far as time, are we shooting for 10 minutes? I yeah, something like that. The time? Yeah, you, can go longer. you can go to about 12, I think, because there's three people. Okay. Yeah. All right. I just wanted to make sure. So I'll start with a poem and, and not ramble too long. Um, gosh. I feel like sometimes you start looking at the book and then you're like, which one do I want to do? All right. Uh, I will start with the first poem in the book, which is inspired by a painting by a painter here in, in the States called, her name is Brittany Leanne Williams, and it has the same title as the painting. Um, I'll drop it in the chat so you guys can see it too. Uh, I thought I had it here. Okay, well, even if you can't, you can Google it and I'll drop it in the chat when I'm done. Transcending the bow. To be above, to float, to rise, to crumble within the dusk. Rich spectral butterflies dipped in umber and kink. Pink as your palms and soles tickling autumn leaves with tenderness wavering like the opening of mouths. Arc and flutter, you dance in the womb of the sky among arteries and capillaries, reaching out as heavy branches. Understand how roots twin that blood dance underground, spread wider, deeper, all of you, all of us, swimming, folding, lofty kicks in the air. Someone will attempt to remind you even in this, a honeyed cloudless expanse, 
that people hid and died in such cradles. You recall and still levitate alive with unbound grace. I have a couple of new, new poems. Like I just wrote them this week. So I wanna read at least one of those. And um, I'll start with the longer one. It's called Untitled for a Reason. You are curled under unconsummated kiss, folded into the violence of blueberries crushed between teeth, dying sugars of a once growing fruit and I let it linger. Your hands map a body that requires no discovery nor conquest. You speak soften drama of fury and frenzy, quiet underbelly, light beaming into peaceful dark, interrupted by minor collisions bodies were built to withstand. You looping daydreams and gasps silent under skin until partitions of distance and judgment lapse into surreptitious mist. You are the laugh that falls orange against my cheek and dries slight sweat cooling. In the smallest fleck of imagination, you become a dream. I needed to recall as muscles found new persistence, flexing in a crucible where the world expands beyond the steady scruff of some sandpaper graded routine. You, small map unfolding a globe that vanished within mundane block. You open a door with a word, if any, or a pause hanging like an ornament in your full smirk. Yeah, I, I can't help but smile. Somebody makes me smile sometimes. Um, <laughs> I'll do this other new poem. I was talking with a wonderful native poet here in the States named uh, Jake Skeets. Uh, he's of the Diné tribe and he was talking about, he's particularly interested in the Anthropocene in his work. And I was like, I've never heard anybody say that about their poems. So I went and looked up the term and I was thinking of that term a lot when I wrote this poem. So this poem's called, When We Worship Apocalypse. Days so hot, bare skin feels trapped under tight layers of plastic. Intolerant sweat, slippery heat without end or escape. The world finds cracks in the body, fissures like age, the number on a scale where feet rise and kneel in prayers for fewer pounds, hormones that fizzle in the last squirms of tears and outbursts. Blame the vulnerable home of meat, bone, and blood. The microns of chemicals congregate in the lungs, gather in the blood to hue choruses. Praise the fatal Sabbath that all bodies succumb to after chipped threadbare lives where we don't know how or where the pruning began. So, new poems, yay! I, I've done a few readings with Saida, Saida and Terry and Saida always brings a new poem. Maybe she didn't today. I'm not going to put her on the spot, but I was like, I got to read at least one new poem if, if Saida's reading with me. Um, <laughs> so this is, I'll read a third poem that's not in the book. And then I'm going to read some other poems from Refuse to Disappear. So short poem, it's called, Are You Ready? Um, it's inspired in part from a line by Gwendolyn Brooks that Kanye West sampled for his song, Praise God. And he, he actually, Kanye had sampled a clip of his mother reading uh, a poem by Gwendolyn Brooks called Speech to the Young, Speech to the Progress Toward. So if you're on TikTok, you've probably heard it and did not know that either one, it was a Kanye West song, but two, that it was actually Kanye sampling Gwendolyn Brooks. So the line will sound familiar when I read it probably. Are you ready? Even if you are not ready for the day, it cannot always be night, Gwendolyn Brooks. Even if you are not ready for anything black, it cannot always be white. Even if you're not 
ready for the women. It cannot always be the men. Even if you are not ready for the spectrum, it cannot always be a binary. Even if you're not ready for the poor, it cannot always be the rich. Even if you ain't ready for the thickness, it cannot always be a bone. Even if you're not ready for the fight, it cannot always be the dance. And even if you're not ready for the dance, it cannot always be the fight. Even if you're not ready to begin, it cannot always be the end. So, and thank you guys for the wonderful comments. Um, I'm seeing them stream. I'm trying to pay attention at the same time. That's a, that's a feat in and of itself. Um, oh, I'm gonna just, mm, 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 let me not blush. Um, <laughs> so uh, one of the poems that I kind of wrote in a flush, I was on a bus, I was in my PhD program still, I think when I first wrote a draft of this poem. And um, I had been listening to this R&B singer called Miguel. And I kept thinking about standardized testing and how could we put that in a love poem when you think about the analogies that we get. So I got this poem, Hip Hop Analogies, after Miguel and Erica Badu. If you be the needle, I be the LP. If you be the buffed wall, I be the cry line. If you be the backspin, I be the break. If you be the head nod, I be the baseline. If you be Philly, I be the razor. If you be microphone, then I be palm. If you be cypher, then I be beatbox. If you be hands thrown up, then I be yes, yes, y'all. If you be throwback, then I be remix. If you be footwork, then I be up rock. If you be turntable, then I be crossfader. If you be the downtown C train, then I'll be the South Pound Red Line. If you be shell toes, then I be hoodie. If you be freestyle, then I be peace book. If you be sharpie, then I be tag. If you be boy, then I be girl who wants to sink samples into classic. Um, so there is a hip hop feel to this book in some ways. And then in other ways, I think it's just me being me. Um, I've taught poetry in prisons for a while. So I'm gonna read this poem and this one more after that because I don't wanna go too long. So this is called um, Small Illuminations. One, Albert is a gentle tower. His arms arched over tabletop like bridge beams or girders. Even if he does not understand everything he reads, smiles like a good kid, like the kid he probably was some 30 years ago when he was in the wrong car with the wrong people at the wrong time that he will never get back. Two, the attention to detail borders on flawless, unscuffed white sneakers, perfected line fades tucked under precisely folded scullies, immaculate with what you got as a clean, hard fought pride. Three, one week I bring crisp folders, a bundle of sharpened pencils with full pink erasers, round and soft as a doll's blush. They rub away small errors, clearing smudges from a page like an actual correction. Four, I look for Albert's easy grin first, when I walk into the concrete block classroom, locked in the education building, relieved that the broken window denies the cold like a plea, one brother in blues with thermal sleeves peeking out of the dull faded ocean of cloth arching over his torso. A cellmate hands me the slightly worn, safeguarded, staple bound book of poems, the signature resolute and matching letters of a poet's name who strolled into prison like a mother without fear of any child. Margaret Burroughs, more than a decade since she left the cell of her body, I clutch her poems knowing how they pass from her hands like a prayer. We both smile, small illuminations in a dark hell when the cellmate says, 
Albert wanted you to have this. He got transferred. He knew you'd keep it safe. And um, now that I'm realizing, some of you may not be familiar with Margaret Burroughs. Dr. Burroughs started uh, the Southside Cultural Center here in Chicago, but she, which is the one remaining works WPA project from that era of that was started by Roosevelt here. And she also started the DuSable Museum, which is one of the first African-American history museums. And I live really close to it. I could walk to it from my house. But I, she also taught at prisons for many, many years. So a lot of my, I, knew, I had students who actually had her as a teacher. So I'm glad she got to be in this book in that way. Um, I'll read this last poem. I keep threatening to do a book of poems about me and my best friend Aurelius. Um, he pops up in this poem because <laughs> sometimes we do writing dates and stuff and just little stories come up. And this is one of those stories. Fubu, after Solange Knowles. I'm sitting in a cafe with my boy that I have known longer than my students have been alive before the birth of his firstborn son. And the waiter wears a tight black camisole with bright green beads. We smile because he is living his joy. And how many people do that on the daily? And how many of us know that joy, like pink and blue hair clips latched onto flawless waves? And we must know someday where we are as serene as Solange's expression, always shaming Mona Lisa, who never knew about the ice grill or paper cranes. I find myself wanting to raise my fist like I'm in an elevator with my sister's husband talking sideways, but I have no sisters as blood kin. I find myself waiting to celebrate all the history that made me and be a little gutter too because once I carry it in my pocket, it's my slingshot and my stone, rubbed smooth by time and fingers. I find myself counting the sway of what I claim and protecting it like the last medallion that could be stolen. So thank you for having me. And this is the book. I'm so excited to join you guys today. I'll drop a little link in the channel for my book and I hope you guys stay in touch. You can find me on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. My new Instagram is Tara Betts Shy Town. Um, who was the publisher of the last book, Tara? Oh, this book is published by WordWorks Books. Um, I can pop that link in the chat as well. And do that, do that. Yeah, okay. Thanks Thank so much. That, that was wonderful, yeah. Thank you. I'm happy to join you guys. Next, we hear from uh, Saida Agostini uh, Bostic, who is a queer afro ghanese poet whose work explores the Black folks' harness mythology to enter the fantastic. Her work is featured in Plume, Hobart, Pulp, Barrel House, Auburn Avenue, among many others. Uh, her work can be found in several anthologies, including Not Without Our Laughter, Poems of Humor, Sexuality and Joy, The Future of Black, and Plume Poetry Number no. 9. She's the author of Stunt, from Neon Hemlock, uh, a chapter reimagining the life of Nellie Jackson, a black madam and FBI spy from Natchez, Mississippi. Her first full length collection, uh, Let the Dead In from Alan Squire Publishing was released in spring 2022. A Kavi Khan graduate fellow and member of the Black Ladies Brunch Collective, Saida is a two time Pushcart nominee and best of the net finalist. Her work has received support from Ruby Artist Grants and the Blue Mountain Center, amongst others. She lives online at www.saidaagostini.com. Go and explore her there and welcome Saida. Mark, can you go around with me and like just say my, my bio for me? I'm just saying like the, the husky voice, the Australian <laughs> accent, I was like, oh, I sound really good. Okay, so, <laughs> so thank you. Um, it is a joy. Oh and an honor to be here with y'all today. Um, I'm gonna read some new poems. So yeah, <laughs> you know, you Tara. And, um, and then I'm gonna share some poems from my first collection, um, Let the Dead In, and yeah. 
So I guess just to start off for context, um, I'm working on a series of new poems right now because I turned 40 this year. And as one does, you know, um, I'm writing sermons, you know, because that's what you do when you turn 40, you write a series of poetic sermons. Um, and so this one is called A Brief Sermon on Patriotism. And the epigraph um, is from an interaction that I had from with someone um, in August, a colleague in my sector. Um, and he said, I will die for the right to believe you will go to hell. If you say you love America, I know you will never love me, save for the stern wonder of my hands. Would you love me more headless and jasper or ridden with bullets as I lay with my love in Louisville, or swollen and faceless, a young corpse robed in Jackson's sick water. I want you to love me better than you have ever loved yourself. Pledge allegiance to something more tender than the memory of your cherished forefathers, their eyes forever glazed as they survey ruthless and bloody fields, train tracks and rich houses carved with sweat. My God, I want to love myself. Be adored in the languages I know. Say it with me, free. So free, I never speak in contraction. My dead don't walk with me, they stay at rest. And when I call out, it is not for forgiveness or to weep at America's unending amnesia, but rather how easily I wear freedom, dance in it, hollering naked down streets. In my heart, we are always this way, alive in the face of threat, feasting on rock, the pulse of an earthquake. Look again at this bloody country. Trace every vein of ore, the tectonic slide of earth ruining beneath an encroaching shore. Your beautiful bright home, a halo beckoning to a hungry black dawn. The sun burning stingy with everything stolen in the name of liberty and fall abashed at my feet that you are not yet dead by my hands. I know love be better than I will ever know my own beginning. Um, thank you. And so I'm gonna read um, another newish poem um, that I'm like low key obsessed with. I think this might be the best poem I've ever written. Um, I can stunt on myself because it's my poem. Um, and it's called, let the world be like my pussy. If I can find it, give me two seconds. Da, 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 da. Sorry, y'all. This is the problem with having all of your poems on Google Docs. That's so weird, I can't find it. Um, give me two seconds, my apologies. Yeah, we have to wait for this one. You can't introduce a poem with that title and not let us hear it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Gerd. Awesome. Let the world be like my pussy. The first time I looked at my pussy was after reading The Color Purple. You remember the part. Miss Seeley takes a mirror angles it between her own soft black thighs and gasps at the beguiling wonder of wet purple dusk, blind to the mundane tasks of the day, mister or even shug in the hazy delights her lips can erupt unbidden. Why labor when your body is built for pleasure? Let the dishes go unwashed, the food stand moldering, fringed with its own new fungal birth. Look at yourself and know what is at the center. I've taken thousands of photos, my fingers a sacred V, cradling the clit in labia like light she keeps changing. Six days a month, pussy is a wraith, bitter, bloody, and turning, madder than apples, limbed with its own haunting. 
Then pussy becomes a centaur, winged, pounding, soft and glorious, charging. She is, in short, impossible, but a revolution, a volta when another pussy is locked against her. I know the world can be like this, curling and attentive, lovelorn and imperious, angle the mirror closer. Let us know that in any language or form, we are utterly, unerringly beautiful. Let us find the center, a shining galactic aperture and begin again. Yeah, so um, thank y'all for that. Um, and you know, Hopefully at some point that will get published. And I'm now going to be reading for my first collection of poems, which both Tara and Terry um, played such huge instrumental roles in like encouraging me to get this published. Um, so just so much love um, to both of y'all and just so honored that we get to be in space together. Um, and so I'm going to read, um, this is literally the first poem in the book. It's called, Where Does the Story Start? With outrageous grief, so luscious, so rare, we'll keep it for generations. Bring it out at the finest of dinners, plant it in fields and thresh its stalks at night. It starts with a ring of jeweled mermaids beckoning great uncle Harold from solid ground to a golden city submerged in shining black water, his wife weeping and weeping at the shores among his rough nets, Harold's boat empty and rollicking in the middle of a river. Him rising after seven days towards the Pomeroon sun, pulled up, wailing by scaled, lovely arms. It starts with the Jumbi, dead slave children hungry for friends, pining in the wind behind Great Granny's house, drawn to salt and fevered blue fire. It starts with broken glass, the surprise of blood in a wife's waiting mouth, my great grandfather's hand curled in a fist. It starts with a riot of stubborn love, more drunk than the pastor at my baptism. With one lie, then another, then another, until a whole world is born and we wait a revolt of Black girls. So, yeah, um, you know, I feel like this has just been, it's always, I mean, it's never been the easiest time to be Black and queer, um, but being a Black queer woman, I think in this particular moment that we find ourselves in, um, it's really hard, y'all. And so um, I just want to read about Black love to you. Um, and so this is actually a love poem that I wrote to my mother. Um, and it's called, I Write of My Mother in the Book of Joy. Most evenings find mummy pacing down cooling paths in a blaze of blossoms. Nothing that lived in Guyana can be nursed here. So instead her resistance is found in the bud of hydrangeas, gladiolas, and a love of hummingbirds. The most common of flowers will be tended. During the summer, she glories in the rightness of blooming, dedicating hours to pulling errant weeds that choke the root. Even in winter, she is pledged to nursing life in the bitterest of Maryland snow. Think on the four lime trees sheltering in our house by the dining table, forcing my blustering father to cower at least for a short while in its branches. Neighbors come by to exclaim at the impossible orchard reared among wood planked walls. My mummy, the stubborn farmer, laughing proudly by its fruit. Requests for advice returned with exacting directions on wind, sun, and timing. Yet, when my sister and I hear her, what we think of are two little girls reared less gently than this. Her, a young, lonely mother with sometimes brutal hands. But here I am, crying at the lesson of her bowed back in the garden, hands dug into a mire of dirt, stubbornly willing love into life. 
I'm going to read one poem, one, one more poem um, and get out the way. Um, if you enjoyed any of this work, I would encourage, I would say, please, please support in any way that you can. And we'll be, and we'll share my um, poem collection and sh we'll share the link to my poem collection with you as well. Um, and the last poem I'm going to read for y'all is Two Fat Black Women Are Making Love. And the joke is right there ready, shuddering, and alive, rife with promise. There are so many paths that have been worn out for a quick, easy laugh. Tyler Perry strutting with a gun and wig, screaming rotund and loud like a Medea would. Martin calling out your mama on television, or the meme of a young woman shot underhand, her belly in love with a tight skirt, hands moving towards an open mouth. Look at everything she devours. Imagine it. Does it make you hungry too? Two fat black women are making love on a bed on the floor and they are weeping for joy. They are crying great folds of flesh flushing and shaking. One cannot look in the mirror save for thinking of her daddy. All this ugly and skin together counts the men who say they hate her body as they do bitter cops and dead black boys. Two fat black women are making love and they touch each other like they can hold it. Honeyed, profane body, like patriots, like their bodies have never been folded into freezers, screamed at on streets, coaxed or threatened, sweet, like they have names, like we will know them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Saida. That was amazing, especially that last poem. Wow. I can see it very visually, actually. Next, we hear from Terry Ellen Cross Davis, who is the author of More Perfect Union, for, uh, the 2019 journal Charles B. Wheeler Book Prize, and Haint, the 2017 Oiana Poetry Book Award. In 2022, she was one of two state recipients of the Maryland State Arts Council Awards, Arts Award. Uh, in 2020, she was awarded the Poetry Society of America's uh, Robert H. Winner Memorial Award. Her work has appeared in print, online, and many journals and anthologies, including Harvard Review, Pank, Poetry Ireland, Kenyan Review, and many others. She's received fellowships and scholarships to Carly Cunham, Hedgebrook, Sawani Writers Conference, and more. She is Obi Hardison po Poetry Series Curator and Poetry Programs Manager for the Forger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C., and lives in Silver Spring, Maryland, with her husband, the poet Hayes Davis, and their two children. Welcome, Terry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Cassandra, for having me here. Um, and it's just lovely basking in the light of the Saida and uh, Tarbet, it's just lovely. You know how much I love hearing hearing your work, both of you all's work. So, and I wanna, I wanna echo what Tara said, cause I've, I too have never been to Australia, but listen people, Opal is my birthstone. That's all I'm saying. And I understand you all have a lot of them. So, you know, let's just make this happen at some point. Um, so I'm inspired, I will read new work. Ah, oh, feel brow beaten into it. <laughs> but um, here's a, a new poem that, uh, I wrote that will be in Hopkins Review uh, coming out, uh, I think next month. And it's called Playing God, and it's in two parts. So Playing God, one, Old Testament God. I put on the sunglasses, headphones, bathe in blood spray, then narrow the world to dirt and dig. My fingers follow tendrils, spindly runners, winding to Clover's green heart. I pull, I grip the goose in Bermuda grass, the nimbleweed, chokeweed, Bedford strangler, even common violet, I gather and smite with one hand. Weeding clarifies want. Witness the dandelion's milk white root, bared naked from the crumbling earth. This yard of void is being made into my image. Two, New Testament God. If I name a plant months later, it's a seedling reaching for the sun. With these small brown hands, I raise the slumbering tubers and bulbs, the catatonic seeds until blossoms bigger than my head dip to greet me. As bees parade in a pollen stupor, I get drunk on the Asiatic lily's hot pink as its trumpet petals ombre to white. 
I glory in the biblical plague of rows of Sharon babies. I sing gospels to the white lilacs tower of panicles. I sculpt this rectangular patch, inch by inch, knowing where the sun peeks through oak leaves, where the lily of the valley spread themselves in shadow. I know the Japanese anemones hunger as they fight the hostas elegant unspindling. I may not get that raise or new job, but I will get a may when every way I turn is a fragrant revelation. So I'm going to move from that to um, my second book, uh, More Perfect Union. <laughs> you see the, I don't know, I'll right, I have it all blurred. That's the, that's the book. And this poem is called Partis Sequitur Ventrum. And that means a Latin phrase that stands for the principle that the children of an enslaved woman are themselves born as slaves and owned by their mother's master. I read this poem for Donovan Lewis who lost his life, 20 year old man shot in bed by the Columbus, Ohio police. And in America in general, black people have a 2.5 time greater chance to be shot dead by police. In Ohio, it's 4.5 and I'm from Ohio. So that, that touches me and every time I go to visit, I feel less secure in my own home state. Part of sequitur ventrum, one, morning, his knobby six-year-old knees, his ancient pace as if to keep step with the question steady overflow. Is there a giant octopus in the Bermuda Triangle? How is paper made? How do fireworks know when to explode? No one told me black boys could burn so bright. Wait, I am wrong. The dark sky has seen their fire snuffed by white hoods malevolent blue eyes in bluer uniforms, white women's screams, all have been matched to their tender wood. So I hug my son tight, kiss the curl crop so close it's straight. My mother, I insatiable, he is dessert and I'll always have seconds. Each morning I lick my thumb, clean him up good, wishing in vain the amniotic sac had dried to armor. Two, night, his lisp, Loose, syrupy sweet sneaks into my ear. Feel its heat, small source more flicker than flame. Flanked by arms still dreaming of muscle, he claims my squishy stomach the best pillow. If the security of our locked arms could extend beyond growth spurts, clocks, calendars, to the someone interviewing him, to the someone following him in the store, to the someone holding my son's life in trembling fingers poised above a phone's keypads, let my love be a note safety pinned to his chest. Send him back, alive, unharmed. As a Black mother in America, I know my whales are birthright, pinned with iron, pinned in ink. And when I read that, I think about Donovan Lewis's mother and just the gamble. It takes the love of black body that you've made in this country. It's, as Saida said, blackness is a gamble everywhere. And I feel like loving a black person is a gamble too, because at some point you feel like you have a danger to have your heart broken. So there's that. Ah, okay. <laughs> so I'm going to move on to something. Um, I'm moving to this poem. This is called Thank You, Jesus. And um, so this is, <laughs> this is, well, this says it says all. Uh, thank you, Jesus. When the blue and red sirens pass you, when the school calls because your child beat the exam and not a classmate, when the smartphone drops but does not crack, the rush escaping your mouth betrays your upbringing. Thank you, Jesus, a balm over the wound. When the mammogram finds only density, when the playground tumble results in a bruise, not a broken bone, like steam from a hot tea kettle, Thank you, Jesus. And the pent up fear vents upward, out. Maybe it's a hand over breast, supplication learned deeper than flesh. As if one could shush the soul, the fluttering heartbeat with three words. Maybe it's not so dire, an almost trip on the sidewalk, the accumulated sales total showing savings upon savings. Maybe it's as small as an empty seat on the Metro, or maybe, Thank you, Jesus, becomes the refrain every time your husband pulls into the driveway, alive and whole, and no one has mistaken him for all the black scary things. You mutter it, helpless to stop yourself from the invocation of a grandmother who gave you your first Bible. You say it because your mother, even knowing your doubt as a vested commodity, still urges prayer. You learned early to cast the net, 
thank you, Jesus. And it's a sweet needle that gathers the fraying thread, hemming security and steady stitches. From birth, you've heard this language. As an adult, you've seen religion used nakedly as ambition, yet this sacrifice of praise still slips past your lips, this lyrical martyr of your dying faith. And just so you know how like intent my mother is, we were visiting Cleveland not too long ago and I'm unpacking and she slipped a daily bread, which is like a little pamphlet of prayers into my, into my stuff without me knowing. <laughs> it's like, you just ne she's never gonna stop, never gonna stop. So, so, I mean, you know, can't blame her, can't blame her. I understand how she feels. Um, so just to lighten it up just a little bit, because I'm always appreciative of how Saida brings the body to light and makes it alive. I am going to read Ode to Orgasms, because if you've ever had one, then you know how much of an ode they deserve. Um, <laughs> so we should all have odes to orgasms. Ode to Orgasms. When the wild abandonment of pleasure calls, trilling its glorious song, you surrender, forget yourself, respond in kind, moaning an ecstatic ode to the rivers of flesh, the delta, the well plowed field. This back arching work results in trembling limbs, shuddering, simpering joy. Not all is submission. You sought this treasure bird, whether in sun dappled bed, sudden on a Saturday while children frolic a floor below or on a sodden tree trunk in the aftermath of a February's record breaking snow. Be it a quick tryst in a hotel stairwell, desire domineering a long drive, you committed, flung open the shutters of propriety to pursue this elusive creature. Now grasp its golden tail feathers, leap from mountaintop to mountaintop, gulp that sweet, sweet fleeting air. And um, I forgot to check my time. So maybe one more. I think we had time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay, so I'll end with this, which is the second to last poem in the book. Um, and this is called, because A Revolt of Black Girls. I was like, oh, I got it. I got to do it now. Um, this poem suggests revolution. This poem no longer consents to play mammy or to wet nurse a seething rage at her own black teeth. America, your teeth have come in. You nip too much. This poem refuses to play religion. A Bible verse will not absolve you, America. If the pursuit of happiness, life, and liberty came from the creator, she's about ready to backhand you in the face. This poem will not be your bottom bitch, America. This poem does not consent to blackness being window dressing for the diversity brochure of a country where the board of directors never changed. This poem reads the fine print on you, America. This poem consents to be black ink, a clenched fist, pepper spray, and black souls marching on asphalt, freedom for and from you, America. If need be, this poem consents to double as witness, the dotted I in the missing reparations decree. Until then, let this poem heckle you, America. Let it yell, goddamn, U.S., choke on cotton, while fanning itself and the flames. Understand this poem doesn't want to be bloodthirsty. It would rather write about the cleanse of a cloudburst than the vengeful force of a water hose. In truth, this poem courts hope. Like a volta, it wants to turn the page writing, America, let us pin a new document, not a perpetual union, but a chokehold removed as a black throat breathing freely is a self-evident truth. Let these lines be facts submitted to a candid world. And this poem, when spoken or read, let it alter, let it abolish you. Thank you all so much for this time and to be in in this glorious sun of, of the work. Thank you so much, Terry. It was fantastic. Uh, well, all of your readings were fantastic. Um, actually, one of the best shows in my mind. Um, Tara, Saida, and Terry. Wonderful work. Um, and now I'm going to hand the mic back to my old friend, Cassandra Atherton who's going to usher us into a little open mic scenario, I believe. Absolutely. We've got some fantastic, fantastic readers, some new ones and some regulars. So we're going to start with Margaret. So uh, Margaret was going to read last week, but it was the illustrious Mark's birthday and we didn't have an open mic. So I'm excited to hear her this week because she's had to wait a couple of weeks. So Margaret, oh, can we get you. you to read for us, please? Oh, yes. And thank you for doing this. Appreciate it. Loved all of the readings. It was remarkable to sit here. So thank you from my heart. 
This one's called, it was written actually a year ago, uh, Grieving Another Roe v. Wade Upset. Locked inside a steel encased echo chamber of armor, braced at elbows, gloved fingers unbent, held rigid, fast face masked, neck stiffened, ribs restrained, chest burning, breasts wrapped in gauze and chain mail in layers of ages with slits for eyes created by some men for some men, though all women wear their creeds, but far below energy gathers at waist, fabric flows in different layers. If only we can turn unconstricted by heavy metal, if only we could spin softened by feathers and cloth that would tickle our knees, we could shed and shed. Thank you. That was amazing. If only. I love the shed and shed at the end. What a fantastic metaphor. Thank you so much for reading. It was wonderful to hear you. Thank you. Our next reader is Cynthia. Cynthia, come on down to the to the Zoom floor and let's let's hear a poem from you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have been so inspired by the readings. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm very happy to hear you all. All right, I'm going to read, it's very chill here in Alaska, it's gotten cold already. Um, I'm going to read at which point of the winter are we? Current branches lose their graceful, near, nearly translucent frozen leaves to a winter come early and fall so soon, fall far down, berries round, curvaceous with bumps, stand stark, bare, red, pronounced in the snow, hovering outside the window, about to happen, the white encrusting them, reminding us of well-wrapped wounds with origins long ago, parents raising us on a wing in a prayer like magpies screeching, bossy dogs shepherding pups around, nips in the early afternoon, birds in the yards quickly taking seed to bring their young before the sounds of canines frighten them off, determining the size of their chick's meals. What part of the winter is this? The winter of our disconnect is over. The winter of our peace exists in two degrees. I've learned to wear extra to protect myself. Feathers from birds stuffing a slick black fabric amid squawks magpie talk magpie talk, camp robbers, edgy with hunger. Mother, now alone with her covered wounds in the big house the Mennonites built after the fire. Her son, my brother, made even larger for that one woman. So unlike the start of her teen winters, corralling we, her pegging, pecking magpies. My sister and me, her teen had babies. And she, easy Edie, touted us along to fairs, where she sold rainbows in genuine Australian crystals. Edie, the rainbow lady, hoping for an early summer, working carnivals, selling stained glass creations, jeans and leather jackets, shivering, refusing to wear feathers, smokes the ganja to get warm, accepts a man's heat, accepts errant accommodations, moves constantly, but does not stop long enough to notice frosty current leaves, never passing on a moment of stolen intimacy. Wow, thank you so much. I got Australian crystals got a Guernsey as well. So that's really exciting. But no, so much beautiful imagery, nearly translucent frozen leaves. And I love the line I've learned to wear extra to protect myself. So, so much good stuff in there. Thank you for sharing that with us. You're welcome. Naima, I've, I, I'll just blame my Australian accent if that's not the way that you say your name, <laughs> but um, you are Naima. next. Naima, there yes. we go. Naima, we would love to hear from you. Thank you. I'm going to share um, a poem from my um, upcoming collection, COVID, The Worthy Wilds of a Mind Under Lockdown, which will be available to buy at Waterstones and Micah Press from October the 3rd. And um, this poem is called Limbo. Africa calling, a convoy in the shadows, constant and ever present, a home, but not a home, anointing my edges, 
still I fit nowhere. Here, my name is foreign, my appearance questioned. But where are you from? Originally, probes Goldilocks, cornfields in her hair. I have reconciled with the damp, dark streets, pierced by dimples of obtrusive artificial light, illuminating an artificial pond. The dry wit and caustic humour, the sarcasm, the armour we wear. The sleazy, sullied snickers of bawdry backstreet jokes, the women who reject gazing at the floor, audaciously holding his stare. The jangle of frenetic city life, the busy lives of others filtering into our busy breaths, in the darkened alcoves and desolate cubicles of existence, Sartre echoed, you are in bad company. The clattering coffee shops amid sips of acrid arabica, the inane monologues on current affairs, clandestine consultations, a temporary respite soaked in caffeine and butter pastries. London calling, cosmopolitan and enthralling. It is the home of a lodger, the key to the kingdom presenting the illusion of belonging without belonging the solitude as natural as blinking. There, my name is familiar, my appearance fusing with the dry alleyways and whitewashed facades facing off a fierce sun. In the hotchpotch pe pavement cafes where once Ginsberg and Jean Genet sucked on mint tea, where tolerance is privately practiced but never publicly preached. The lamb and cumin infused air that coils and slivers before reclining across your skin like an impermeable veil. The language of my ancestors tinged with my Britishness. My speech fluent yet betraying as wide-eyed locals chuckle like a pacifying parent. You're not from here, are you? In the Medinas, the night sky turns down the heat as families parade in their best attire. Sunflower seeds whose saltiness fizzes on the tongue. Dry roasted peanuts washed down with canary iced lemonade. The men who gawk belligerently, their eyes betraying the indignity of a shameless woman who refuses to look away. The crested clay tagines joyously bubbling away. Terracotta fat jolly uncles. The enticing wisps of flavor. The fragrance of enfance. The Gnawa drum beats a throbbing pulse, dancing, chanting, healing, a portal to the beloved on the wings of a trance, a cultural hub that captivates and offends, a shared identity on an organic pond, rich with community, kindness, support, love. To serve is to be with Allah, the allotted roles deeming marriage and its fruit the paragon of ambition, gender hindered, Scornful eyes from the arbiters of decency as I light my cigarette. I am without decency and without God, casting off the shackles of both, the dogma of belief or illusion in the clutches of tradition, bleeding bequeathed injury, spurred on by my scars. You are not from here, are you? The cross of the diaspora, life's longing for the other, each suit offering some comfort but ill-fitting nonetheless. Thank you. Thank you so much and congratulations on your new book coming out. We'll all look for that in stores. And I love anointing my edges, still I fit nowhere. What a very moving line. Thank you so much for reading for us, Neymar. Thank you for having Next, me. Thank you. Come back anytime. We'd love to hear more. Ron, I just cheekily put you down because I thought you'd probably have something for us. Is Ron still around? Yes, he is. Um, no, I don't have to read. It's okay. Well, I put you down. Well, I've been put down many times, but okay. <laughs> fair enough. Well, I like your stuff, so maybe next week. Maybe next week you'll repost. Better go to the famous John Wessick, who has a book in his mix. Show it. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, every, by the way, other people have said, you know, the problem with Ron Bremer is he comes and he never reads anything. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, yes, here's a proof copy of my latest uh, upcoming uh, poetry collection, The Shaman in the Library. And on the back, 
uh, there is a, a blurb from somebody named Cassandra Atherton. And if you don't know Cassandra Atherton, you should, because she's really great. Um, I will read a prose poem from the book. It just gets better and better. We've got prose poems, we've got endorsements, we've got a new book, we've got a jacket. Or, or may, maybe it's a piece of flash fiction, I don't know. It's called <laughs> The Theater of Space and Time. You appear on a stage of stopwatches and meter sticks only to have a drink thrown in your face. Tracy, how could you? A woman in a blue skirt drops her glass, buries her face in her hands and sobs. Harriet, I, you wipe the stinging liquid from your eyes and realize you don't know your lines. How you got here and what led to the woman's outburst remain mysteries. How do you know her name? You stall for time, watching all the while for some clue. This is the last time you'll make a fool out of me. Harriet removes a nickel-plated pistol from her purse and aims it at your face. The nine millimeter semi-automatic is small enough to fit her tiny hand, but its barrel looms cavernous with doom. Is there some kind of script to follow or should you ad lib? You turn to where the prompter should be seated, but your senses can no more pierce the realm behind the stage of space and time than the twinkle of a firefly on an August night can penetrate the methane clouds that cloak Saturn's moons in permanent darkness. The playwright, director, theater owner audience, entrances and exits remain unknown. Only your death, imminent or remote, is certain. Thank you. And that's how John Westwick does it. It's so great. Is there some kind of script to follow or should you just ad lib? We always like to ad lib here. Absolutely. <laughs> Next, we have our Brooklyn poet, Cindy. Oh, what are you uh, for us this week? Are you on mute? Oh, no, you I didn't know I was reading. Just happened to have a poem. You know? <laughs> I knew you would. I would have given you, I did put it in the chat, but you know, I, gen I generally like to hear you read, so I just put you in. One day you're going to ask, and I'm going to have absolutely nothing. But um, this. This uh, poem is a prose poem because I heard that Cassandra fancies prose poems. <laughs> I also heard that they use the word fancies in Australia and Britain. <laughs> and this one is a short prose poem and it's very heavy on alliteration. Um, comes out of a sort of workshop we were doing. And Karen Newberg, who couldn't make it today, wrote a poem with alliteration. So I sort of piggybacked on her. It's called Void and Avoidance. Who is dancing on my vagus nerve? Me, very me, only me, very, very. Vague, viscous, vascular, vaxed. Volatile vials of Valium, ventriloquist's vocal verse in the vein of vernacular. Voila, vigorous, vibrant vitality. No, vacant, veiled, and vexed vestige of myself. Thank you. Oh, it's so good. I'm so glad you read it. Absolutely loved it. I always love your work, Cindy. It's always a joy. Thank you. Thank and you. you know how we finish up lip balm? We finish in a famous kitchen. And Bob is going to give us some words to take with us from one of his amazing poems as we travel on in the rest of our days, whether you're in the morning, like I am in Australia, whether you're in the evening, um, where most of you are, Bob always has something. To, for us to take away. So Bob, what you got? I wanted to read something a little different. This was first published over 40 years ago in Hanging Loose. So music. There is no song at all that can carry the ball the way you do. I can't understand how the bloody red hand works its voodoo. It moves in the air, making circles and squares and curved lines. 
the clouds move away and all through the day I feel fine. And then it is night and a terrible fright starts to grow. A breeze moves the leaves and a terrible wind starts to blow. And although it is August, it feels like it's 20 below. And out on the lake, a dead man is starting to row. He's coming for us, there's no doubt at all in our minds. He's moldy and old and looks like he's probably blind. He stumbles and crawls up onto the bank. He moves straight ahead, his face, it is blank and uncaring. He's a man who could stand at the edge of the sand without staring. Wow, that was fantastic. And you read it so well. So that was Thank a you. really banging way to end what I think is probably one of my favorite lip balms. The readings today have just moved me to such an extent. I just want to write more poetry and, and read all of the books that are in the chat. So luckily I get a copy of the chat when lip balm downloads from cloud. Uh, so Mark, over to you for a final word after this brilliant, brilliant, brilliant lip balm. Well, thank you so much, everybody, especially Tara, Saida and Terry. Such an amazing reading. Um, I'm going to conclude by reading one of my own poems. It's a very short poem. It's seven lines. Um, and it came out in, in this book, The Little Book of Earthly Delights, which is a Chinese character on the front, um, which is little. And the poem's called Indebted. Mad and mortal, painting pictures, friendships, gazing at stars, watching the falling, knowing age is like wine on nimble tongues. Thank you so much, everybody, for such a wonderful night. And we will see you next time. Uh, poetry and love, love and poetry. Bye, guys. Mwah. Love you all.